Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. You know, today is a special holiday for us uh, to remember sort of our heritage, and I thought it would be appropriate to connect in with Naomi McElwaith, uh, Wraith, who is um, someone who spoke to me at an event I was at just a few weeks ago in Edmonton. Uh, and she'll explain what her role is and 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 everything. But I was in Edmonton for a big convention, and uh, we had an event at uh, Fort Edmonton uh, in the evening. And uh, Fort Edmonton has got this carnival kind of setting, and we had uh, drinks and appetizers uh, uh, while we got to go on the Ferris wheel and the merry-go-round and stuff like that. But then they took us to an Indigenous cultural center, and number one, I think uh, the 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 indigenous indigenous cultural center, which really reviewed a lot of the history of the indigenous people of Western Canada, was very interesting. Uh, but then at the end of it was a presentation about the residential schools, and then Naomi um, came out and did, made a speech, and it was very moving. And so I thought that it would be really interesting to connect up with her, um, you know, any day, but particularly on a, on this holiday where we're supposed to remember. Our, our our heritage um, and ask her to talk to us a little bit about it. So Naomi, welcome to the show. Tell us to start with, if you could, what your job is. Okay. Uh, so Tanse, maybe I'll, uh, maybe I'll speak a little bit of Cree so you can hear one of the uh, ancient indigenous languages of our land as I'll sure. just do a, I'll do a formal introduction. So Tanse uh, uh Naomi McElroy, Nitsi Kason. A miskwati was kai knikotsania, um, moya e nita nihiawe yan, maga e no te nita nihiawe yan, a yisk no tawe pan, e kipa kaskit e ki nita nihiawe, a yisk wea ute a yike sa kai knik, maga moya e ki nehiawe te kimunia wit, e quinikawi e e miu akitao kosa sanesquit. Equinia, uh, this is my inside joke, e motomun yawa squewian. So I've given you a traditional, um, a somewhat of a traditional indigenous greeting. I said, hello, my friends, my name is Naomi. I'm from Beaver Mountain House, which is a former indigenous name for Edmonton. It means, I'm uh, Esquitsi, Waskaiknik. I said, I'm not a very good speaker of Cree, but I wish I could be because my late father spoke Cree so well it was like bright colors in a rainbow because he was raised at Ayikisa Gagnik at Frog Lake. I said to you that he wasn't Cree actually, he was a white white man, but he was the only uh, white child in that community and he was completely immersed in, in the community for 10 years as a child. Um, so he didn't just speak Cree like rainbows, the rainbow colors, but he actually basically assimilated to Cree culture and then my mom I told you I'm indigenous on my mom's side uh, my beautiful my mom is a beautiful brown Métis woman and then my inside joke is that I look like a crazy white woman <laughs> so that's so that's that was a traditional greeting I could tell you my grandparents and um, on my dad's side were teachers and um, Charles and Divida McElwraith and my grandma and grandpa on my mom's side were Lucibel and James Meeks so to answer your question uh, what's my role at Fort Edmonton Park? And at the so the uh, it, the place where I work is actually called the Indigenous Peoples Experience. So my current role, I am the Indigenous Narratives Supervisor. So my role is to uh, support my staff in telling the Indigenous story, to in communicating the Indigenous narrative to all the people who come through our space. I have quite a long history in the park. I was an interpreter in the fort. So the, the park began, uh, they started building in 1969 and 1974, the park opened up as Fort Edmonton Park, but it was just the fort. And then through the 70s, they developed 1885 Street. And then through the 80s, they developed 1905 Street. In the 90s and the 2000s, they've been developing um, uh, 1920 Street. So the in I'll say IPE as kind of the abbreviation for Indigenous Peoples Experience. So three, four years, five years ago, actually in 2018, the park closed in September for a massive um, 
uh, renovations to infrastructure, electrical and plumbing and all that. But also in that, from 2018 until 2021, the, uh, the, the IPE was built. And um, so the, the Indigenous people park and the Indigenous people's experience open up again in on July 1st, 2021. And so there was originally a master plan way back when the, the first vision of Fort Edmonton Park came to be. It's on the Mellon Homestead, which is roughly 160 acres. And they, they had this vision to develop it and show the history of, of the history of Edmonton. Um, and there was a plan to include an Indigenous narrative there, but for the first 50 years of our existence of, as a park, that narrative, all it consisted of was a teepee, a small teepee outside of the fort walls. And so um, about 10 or 15 years ago, uh, FAMCO, the Fort Edmonton Management Company, was hired to consult with various Indigenous people, local Indigenous people, to envision what you saw when you came through the IPE. And so the groups that were involved were, the, I'm a city employee, so the City of Edmonton, the Fort Edmonton Management Company, the Fort Edmonton Historical uh, Foundation, which is uh, does fundraising, Treaty 6, Treaty 7, Treaty 8, uh, the Métis Nation of Alberta, and a Council of 50 elders. So that's a lot of people at the table. And they said, what do you want? And what you saw is what they wanted. So everything, everything in that cultural center, the, everything in the IPE is from an Indigenous perspective. And it's from Indigenous elders. And a lot of it is sacred knowledge. So sometimes people come in and they ask if they can film. Um, uh, and we, we ask people not to film. We, we're not really excited when people take pictures, but it's when we're really busy, it's really hard to police that. So, but a lot of, there's a lot of um, uh, um, artifacts. There's a lot of indigenous art. There's moss bags, there's moccasins. There's a lot TV, of clothing. There's clothing. There's um, buffalo hide. There's teepees. There's a lot of, um, a lot of stuff there. And there's a lot of, knowledge ancient knowledge and wisdom and that comes from from elders and so the most new so uh the most um highly represented would be the plains cree uh who are in in our language it's nehiawak one is a nehiaw and many are nehiawak so the plains cree are there's a lot and there's a lot of indigenous languages written on the walls and on the screens there's a multimedia show of buffalo coming in through the seasons and geese and the trees talk and the floor changes through seasons. And just so the conversion really of uh, what was the area of, of Edmonton to Edmonton today. Uh, yeah. Showing, uh, the, the city that grew out of uh, the plains is fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. You would have seen that in the arrivals. Uh, it starts with the, with the spring where there's just just the bison and no human beings and then the geese come and then it transitions to to summer and that's when indigenous people arrive and summer is a really busy time for everyone in cold countries but you know um uh um sun dances and powwows and birthdays and weddings and falling in love and having babies and all that and then it transitions from the spring into the fall which is uh post contact so and the fall is sort of roughly the 1860s and 70s, because what you see are river lots on the floor connecting to the North Saskatchewan River, which is the river that goes through Edmonton. Those river lots come to us from feudal France via Quebec and via the fur trade. So that's the fall season. And um, the reason I say it's 1860s or 70s is or is that's, that's when the bison were slaughtered nearly to extinction and uh, agriculture became the new economy and farming. And that's why they made the river lots to give all the farmers access to the water. I remember you mentioning how many bison were actually on the plains or in North America at one point in time. Yeah, yeah. We um, we went to uh, Elk Island Park and the naturalists there told us that 500 years ago, 
between here, northern Alberta and Mexico, there were 40 to 60 million bison. And that corroborates Indigenous oral history. They, they say about 60 million bison. And um, I asked the biologists how they knew that. They, and they said that um, they looked at a map of Turtle Island. So Indigenous people, when you look at a map of, of North America before cities, before colonization, before industrialization, before highways and trains and everything, it looked like a turtle. And so the biologist looked at a map of, Nor of Turtle Island before industrialization and looked at the foliage that was available. Then they just reversed the numbers and they look at how much foliage they need for the Plains bison south of Highway 16 and the Woods bison high north of 16. And that's how they came up with the number of 40 to 16 million bison. And, and how and many so today? Was, so that was in 1500. In 1800, there's 20 million bison. And then by 1870, in seven decades, those 20 million bison had been slaughtered and there was less, there was about 100, 850 bison. So it was a devastating time for Indigenous people. Uh, they were starving. Uh, then we had Elk Island Park and Woodbush Buffalo Park in the early 1900s. And now there are roughly about 450,000 bison. There's been uh, concerted conservation efforts. And there's something that really, really moves me, and it's called the Bison Treaty. So at Elk Island National Park, which is just an hour east of, of Edmonton on the Yellowhead high, Highway, um, they have a bison education program, They all, and they also breed bison. South of the highway, they breed the, the Plains bison, and north, they breed the Woods bison. And they do not accept any bison. They only breed them, and then they ship them out, because if they... Um, have bison coming in, there's a chance of having cattle genes. <clears throat> so what they do, there's an, in this bison treaty, there, it's a treaty between several <clears throat> First Nations in Alberta and Saskatchewan and BC, between a number of Native American tribes south of the medicine line, and then between um, uh, non-Indigenous places like Elk Island, <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's an agreement to bring Brother Bison back. So we're at four, about 450,000 right now. <clears throat> it's got a tickle. The uh, the indigenous people's experience was was impactful and I really quite enjoyed it and the artifacts were were really quite interesting and uh, the historical references uh, particularly I think uh, to uh, the Métis and the Louis uh, Riel uh, um, issue, et cetera, were quite fascinating because it wasn't something I was as familiar with as I probably should have been. But what really impacted me was the final exhibit on residential schools. And the film um, was interesting, very interesting. But your speech, your personal speech was very impactful. And so I'd like you to tell us a little bit about the message that you uh, provided um, to everyone. Uh, and I guess you've been doing it for a while. Uh, but we're going to take a break for some messages first. And so I'm going to give you a two minute little break, breather before you have to come back and tell us your message okay. about residential schools. Stay with us, everyone. We'll be back in just two minutes with Naomi Mackwaith. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Saginaw and 60. We're chatting tonight you know, a holiday Monday about, uh, about our history. And uh, I think it's appropriate to, to remember our history. Uh, as I mentioned on the top, uh, I was uh, out in Edmonton recently at a big convention and we had an opportunity to tour Fort Edmonton and in Fort Edmonton is an indigenous center called the indigenous uh, people's experience. And at the end of, uh, uh, of a very interesting uh, museum uh, exhibit of, uh, of, of, of our history of Indigenous people in, on, on the plains, which is different than in Ontario and different on the west coast of, uh, of, uh, of Canada, uh, was a film about residential schools. And then Naomi um, McIlwaith came out and spoke. And I was blown away by her speech. Nomi, tell us a little bit about what you what you said at the end of this at the end of this film, please. Thank you, Brian. So the film is 
a five minute film that portrays the history of residential schools. It starts um, before people, before people. It starts in nature, there's robins, there's ants, there's running water, and then people arrive, indigenous people arrive, and it's it's an idyllic time, and then there's uh, a shock. There's the tree is cut down, and the, the the heart is taken away from indigenous people. The children are um, basically abducted, taken off to residential schools, and then the aftermath of the residential schools, the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, um, high incarceration rates, poverty, all that. And then the film, there's a shift halfway through the film. There's an elder, her name is Elder Ecti Margaret Cardinal and her teepees, all the teepees inside the IPE she made with her husband. She is having a smudge in the film and she teaches uh, the children in the film four words. And then the film ends with mu high music crescendos and it shows local indigenous people who have overcome so much, doctors, lawyers, teachers, University administrators, musicians, singers, drummers, dancers. It's it, it ends on a real triumphant note. So each of us, um, we started uh, two years ago and we didn't have a, we hadn't actually had time to figure out a plan for the meeting place, but we had had a few soft openings and I stepped in. I had heard the Cree enough that finally after hearing it a number of times, I understood what I was hearing. So I stepped into that circle and I spoke and I translated the Cree. And then from that initial uh, presentation, um, a more formal, I, I've, I've written a more formal presentation, which is the reverse for me because I'm, I'm really quite a shy person and I'm a writer and I became a writer to help me organize my thoughts so I could actually speak. So usually when I make a presentation, it starts with words on paper. <laughs> But this time, it just started with me making the presentation. So now all, all of our staff um, step into that circle when they're assigned to that space and they have their own message. Um, myself and our coordinator, Everett Poor, who is the Indigenous Narratives Coordinator for the park, it's our position that uh, our interpreters, if the pain is too close, if there's, uh, you know, they don't have to to share their own trauma that's that that they don't have to do that some people do but others it's not necessary so for myself my own personal message is i i position i mean i'm not sure if if you can see me but i do not appear indigenous at all um my siblings were all colors of the rainbow um and i look like my beautiful brown mom so we are metis and as i explained in my traditional uh, greeting. It's ironic in my family that my non-Indigenous father was raised culturally on reserve and spoke Cree fluently, and my non-Indigenous mother was basically not raised in, in, with the culture. So I position myself as a Métis person. Um, I, um, I I say Dakotana uh, um, now. Those words, there's no, there's a Basically, that's all you hear. You hear all this beautiful music and you hear these words now over and over and over and over again. And Mo Clark is the Métis singer and she that basically means together we've got to the, where we are and together we're going to move forward. So um, sometimes I tell the story of uh, a non-Indigenous man who came to the IPE, was sitting in the circle when I was presenting and he watched that film. He stayed through at least two viewings and he had a, he was very tall with very white hair and he had a very intense gaze. And he spoke to me afterwards and he told me that in the 1960s and 70s, he was a bush pilot in Northern, uh, Northern Ontario. And his job was to fly into indigenous communities and pick up the children and fly them far away to somewhere else. And he had no in the idea. 1960s in the 1960s and 70s, yeah. And he had no idea his role in getting these, taking these children away from their communities and into up to residential schools. So the, me, the movie is quite transformative for a lot of people. But my personal message is one of peace and hope and goodwill. Um, 
being being not everybody that works in that space, we all have to be Indigenous, either First Nations or Métis. Some are First Nations, some of us are Métis. And I am the least, I, I, I just don't look Indigenous. And so um, I quite purposely position myself as a peacemaker, and you'll find that word on my resume. Um, so uh, the one of the things I say in my presentation is I help the people understand the Cree words that they'll hear because halfway through um, the elder teaches the children four Cree words. And the first one is wakutuwin, wakutuwin. And this means kinship. And this means that we are in kinship with everybody and everything. So our human relatives, but also the trees, the sun, the sky, the water, the buffalo, the coyote, the eagle. Um, we take a very humble position. Our feet are on the ground and we were invented or we were created after everything else. And we saw this in COVID when we all went inside, the air got clean and the animals thrived. Uh, but if, if, if they die, then we're done. So we, we recognize, um, our lower position in life. And we don't feel that we have dominion over the animals uh, as we would might read in Genesis. So uh, is kinship. We're in, we're in relationship with everything. The second word that the, el the old lady um, teaches us is nanaskumuwin. Nanaskumuwin. And these are Cree words. And nanaskumuwin means uh, gratitude. And so one of the things for me personally is it's very humbling, but I'm also, I'm very grateful to work in that space um, and to spend time with people and help them on their reconciliation journey. Sometimes we have indigenous people, sometimes we've got Jewish people, we've got Islamic people, we've got African, we've got people from all over the world who come to see us and, um, what a, what a privilege it is and what an honor it is to share a little bit of time with everybody and help them either first get to know what's happening or to learn more about this story. So I'm, I'm grateful. The third word that the old lady uh, speaks is win. Um, and it means strength. And I'm a pretty fiercely independent person, um, but I've learned I've, in my humble journey on this earth that we're stronger together. So if, if we have a common, a common purpose, a common goal, we're much stronger together. And the last word that the old lady teaches us is sakihitawin, sakihitawin, and this means love. So this is where I speak about my personal connection. I say that I'm a lucky woman because I had two parents who love me, my mom who still loves me, and four grandparents who love me. And those numbers are significant to me. And I think they're significant because a lot of a lot of Indigenous people don't know who their parents are. They don't know who their grandparents are because they were taken away, either uh, abducted to go to residential schools or in the 60s scoops, they were taken away and put into non-Indigenous foster homes. So Saki hit the wind. One thing that's difficult for me, uh, and I, a position uh, makes me quite vulnerable in that space, is I've always known that my dad's parents were teachers, which is why he grew up on reserve. I'm not sure why they left him on reserve, but, but I only learned a year ago that my grandparents, my dad's parents, Charles, and Divida McElroy taught at the Edmonton Indian Residential School. And this is a truth that is very difficult for me to speak at any time, and it's especially difficult in that space, and it's really hard if there are Indigenous people and Indigenous children in that space. Um, I would never defend uh, the horrors. Uh, I mean, residential schools were a hideous thing right from the, they were just so flawed and so wrong. Um, but my grandfather, there was a man that he despised and girls in the school came to report to my 
grandfather about that man and my grandfather reported it and my grandfather was fired and that man stayed. And um, I share this not to have any sympathy or grief or, or an apology or anything. It's just a truth. It's a fact. Um, so that's, that's my, my, um, my dad on my mom's side. Um, we, we don't know if anybody in our history went to residential school. My mom wonders about her grandmother, my great grandmother, who was a, a kind of a wounded woman. Um, uh, but my mom herself was visibly ad indigenous and grew up the first five years on the farm and then went to Regina. At, they moved to Regina and she was coming home from school in grade one and two boys came up and thought it was the right thing to do is to shove her head on the wall and call her a dirty little Indian. And um, one thing is, I like, I like, one thing I say is that we are, we hesitate to use the word Indian um, because it's inaccurate and hurtful, but we sometimes have to use it if we're talking about the Indian Act or Indian residential schools. So my mom didn't know what that meant, so she went home and asked my grandmother. And this happened a second time, and my, my strong hearted um, Indigenous grandma, my, as we would say in some people say my kukum, but the grammatical is nukum, my grandmother, went to both of those boys' homes because they weren't brothers, and she put a stop to it. And um, so I think about that story. I know other people have much, much worse trauma in their, you know, residential schools. Um, one of our interpreters is learning in university that there were residential schools in northern Manitoba that conducted nutritional experiments on the children to determine what was the what was the least amount of food a child needed in order to sustain life. I mean, that's just it's so it's just beyond comprehension. Um, so there's other people uh, in the space who have more trauma, more traumatizing st stories. But racism is a story that my mom endured her whole life. Uh, she was a neonatal intensive care unit nurse and defied every negative stereotype about Indigenous women and yet uh, was told that couldn't go on a honeymoon. Uh, and there were several other microaggressions to her life. So, and then I finish, I, I finish my presentation. I, and I do believe that, I believe it to the, everything in me, I believe that None of us is born with the hate of racism in our heart. And I think racism is at the root of residential schools and of, of all these things. We're not born with that hate, but we learn it from somebody. We learn it from school or social media or TV or adults. But I ask people, um, you know, I say we can't change who, we can't change this story because the story was hidden until about the last 20 years, and now the truth is coming out. So we can't change the truth, but we can change who we are in relation to it. And I ask people uh, you know, to let their children and their ch grandchildren and their descendants say about us, about them, that we're good ancestors. And I also ask people, because there is a legacy of residential schools on every street corner in every big city, small city, every town, if you encounter a homeless person, they are dealing with some kind of trauma and chances are they are indigenous and have inherited or experienced themselves the trauma of residential schools. And so the legacy of residential schools is poverty, homelessness, addictions, incarceration rates, all that. And that's that's my message of peace and hope and goodwill. And I then I often say, Gawi miokisikawa notes. May you have a good day today. And then uh, I ask people uh, if they have any questions to talk to me outside of the room because it's quieter out there. You know, it was interesting um, and very impactful to me that you told much the same story that you've just shared with us, but that you did end with this hopeful note and repeated. Uh, what uh, the old lady said, kinship, gratitude, strength, and love. Kinship, gratitude, strength, and love. Some pretty good principles to live by. 
We're going to take a break uh, for some messages and come back uh, with Naomi in just two minutes. We're going to talk a little bit about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and uh, and why she thinks it's important for us Canadians to hear this story. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour Saga 960. We're chatting tonight with Naomi McElwaith. Uh, wait, Waith? McElwaith? Is that correct? McElwraith. McElwraith, I apologize, who uh, yeah. works at the Indigenous People's Experience, an Indigenous uh, center at uh, Fort uh, Edmonton uh, in uh, Edmonton, Alberta, that I recently visited. Uh, and she's, what do you call yourself, a narrative, an Indigenous narrative provider? Yeah. Uh, Indigenous Narrative Supervisor. Supervisor. And she provided this incredibly interesting and, and to me, very impactful narrative of uh, of the story about uh, residential schools to su- uh, to supplement the the video, the, the movie that uh, she described, but then also to add uh, her own personal um, perspective on it. Naomi, do you think it's important for Canadians to be aware of residential schools? And, and if so, why? Yes, uh, I do think it's very, very important for everyone to know because there is a story, there is a reason for everything. Uh, and there is meaning in every, actually, there is meaning in everything is one of the main themes of the IP, the Indigenous Peoples Experience, the IP. Um, it, it Residential schools explains homelessness. It explains poverty. It explains um, illness. It explains disease and and um, addictions and high incarceration rates and high dropout rates. All of those things find their root in residential schools. Residential schools were run by the churches with the support of the Canadian government. Most the most numerous residential schools were in Alberta, and there were five churches. Let me see if I can get them right. There was a Catholic church had the most. There was the United Church, the Presbyterian Church, the Methodist, and the Anglicans. I think I believe those five uh, churches, but the Catholic Church had the most um, residential schools, and then the most here in Alberta. And um, residential schools were this terrible thing. The food was bad, and there was it wasn't really school at all. They had to do chores. They, uh, the girls were taught domestic duties so they could become maids and domestic maids. The boys were taught um, boys' skills so they become, could become laborers. There really was no intent to educate the children properly. The intent of residential schools, Duncan Campbell Scott and John A. MacDonald, the, they are often called the architects. Duncan Campbell Scott is often called the architect of residential schools, the the real intent was to kill the Indian in the child. And they could not assimilate Indigenous people fast enough any other way. So so abducting the children and cutting them off from their parents and their family and their culture, this is what they were trying to do. And um, I think one of the, this is actually really, quite a personal thing, Um, but there is, uh, it's difficult, it's a difficult thing for me to speak of because I, I, I appear very, very white. Um, The role of alcohol in destroying people and uh, uh, a lot of uh, homeless people on the streets have addictions and um, our family, I was raised in a home with no alcohol. We, wasn't, we weren't a particularly religious family. My parents just agreed that they didn't need it. And then um, we had foster children and one of them uh, who, is, who is still with us, not, not physically with us, but has made it to the age of 40, uh, has a fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and is, is a First Nations woman. And when I think of... Uh, the most, the worst part of colonization, the absolute worst part of it, um, I would say the violence against Indigenous women and the phenomenon of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls in Canada, North America, and the violence um, 
done to unborn children so that when they are born, they are disabled and there is no cure for it. Uh, that, that and many other reasons why it's important to know. Um, it's important to know about residential schools because it's, it's a historical fact. It is a part of our history. It is true that colonial governments and churches did what they could to suppress it, to keep it hidden. It, it does not serve a nation's purpose to, to air its dirty laundry, but Indigenous people in the last 30 or 40 years have been getting educated, have been finding their voice, and it's Indigenous people who are telling this story. So uh, I think that's some of why it's important that we we know about residential schools. Is our government doing enough? What do you think our government should be doing? Do you think our people are doing enough? Yeah. Um, you know, it depends who you talk to uh, you're, and you're talking to me. So I would say, no, the government isn't doing enough. Um, but it's complicated because if we had a different government, they might be doing less. Um, so, you know, we have a more liberal government right now that's kind of le more inclined uh, to at least make some promises. And, you know, I, I think it's only, there's 94 calls to action. So they're not recommendations. Um, they're, the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was a seven-year cross-Canada uh, effort on the part of Indigenous peoples to travel to various communities and listen to residential school survivors tell their stories. And some of, some of those survivors had never spoken to anybody about their experience, and then they, they spoke. And, in res and it's a historical truth. It's a fact that in residential schools, children experience sexual abuse, they experienced physical abuse, emotional abuse, nutritional experiments. It was terrible. Uh, and they were divorced from their families, from their culture, from their language. Yeah, yeah. They had their hair cut. It was such, there was just terrible what happened. And so out of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission came these massive reports and, and 94 calls to action. And that's, they're sweeping. They're uh, calls to action for churches, for schools, for school boards, for hospitals, the healthcare system, for the business world. They're sweeping recommendations and not recommendations, sweeping calls to action. I think there's only been a handful of them even remotely addressed out of the 94. Um, I always think of Murray Sinclair I've not ever met him personally, but he was one of the commissioner of the TRC and he was a lawyer. He's from Manitoba. I believe he's Anishinaabe. And I read, uh, just trying to remember the book, a number of years ago while doing my, my, um, my master's degree, there's a woman in, in northern Manitoba from, from Norway House who moved to the PAW in 1987. She was 17 years old. Her name was Helen Betty Osborne. And she was murdered by four, three white men and an, and an MAT man. And, and, and it was just unspeakable what they did to her. And it was covered up. Um, the authorities, I'm not going to name the authorities, but the authorities were very involved in covering this up. For seven, sorry, it happened in 1970. 17 years later, it came to the light of day. And the one person who got arrested was the Métis guy. And Murray Sinclair presided over, I, I think he presided over that. Uh, if he didn't, he at least wrote extensively about the role of the justice system in hindering justice in that particular case. So I'm not sure if most Canadians know about that. Um, that I mean, he's an older man now. But he, he was a commissioner of the TRC, but years ago, he was a lawyer and a judge in Manitoba, and he dealt with some pretty awful stuff. So he's a pretty inspiring man. Naomi, thank you so much for 
sharing your personal uh, thoughts, your personal connection, your speech, um, and uh, some opinions as to what uh, governments and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, et cetera, did and 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 should do um, going forward. We're going to take a break, and I'm going to ask Naomi when we come back as part of our short conclusion, what she thinks an everyday person in Toronto can do, should do. Stay with us. Everyone will be back in just two minutes. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour Saga 960. My guest tonight is Naomi McAwaith. She is a um, Indigenous speaker at the uh, Indigenous Peoples Experience at Fort Edmonton in uh, in Edmonton, Alberta. I had the pleasure, uh, the honor, not the pleasure, the honor, because it wasn't pleasurable, but it was interesting and it was profound. And so it was the honor of hearing her speak at the end of a movie about residential schools at the end of a tour of this Indigenous people's experience. And I was moved. And you know what? I wanted Naomi to figure out some way to share it with my my audience, um, the profound impact you and and the whole experience had on me. Um what do you think people here that listen to us on the radio in Toronto could do, should do uh, to be able to come more aware of some of the issues in, associated with our indigenous uh, heritage um, in our country and, uh, and the issue of residential schools and the issue of murdering, murdered and missing girls, which, you know, as you pointed out, is probably the biggest tragedy, even yeah, you know, I can't compare tragedies, but 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 my gosh, a big tragedy, just like residential schools are. Mm -hmm. Thanks for this question, Brian. I really appreciate it, and, and it's it's a real honor to be on your show tonight. Um, first of all, to get to know an Indigenous person, make friends, you know, build the trust, have a relationship with an Indigenous person. I know there's people in our nation who don't have. They don't know any Indigenous people at all. Get to know an Indigenous person. Um, I wrote a note here and I can't, uh, I don't know what that means. Oh, go to round dances. So round dances are, are happening in the winter and they're welcome. Everyone is welcome. They, they are moving. Oh my goodness, you dance in a circle and you got old, old little old ladies and some guy with tattoos who looked like he just got out of jail. Everyone's holding hands. Go to a round dance. Um, read. Read books uh, about our history. Read books. There's one that came to mind is called The Education of Aug Augie Morasti, but there's um, uh, Phyllis, uh, uh, The Orange Shirt, um, children's book, She She Echoes Red Shoes. Um, read books. Uh, watch AP APTN, which is the Aboriginal People's Television Network. Go to museums like the Indigenous People's Experience. If I can, I am going to go to the Smithsonian, to the Ameri the Museum of the American Indian. I can't wait to get there. Um, listen, 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 listen. Listen to spend time with Indigenous people and listen. Um, sometimes when an Indigenous person is raised right on reserve, really close to culture, they communicate in a different way. And it might be hard to understand them, but listen to them and ask questions. Try not to make assumptions. And if you don't understand, ask questions. Um, try to have an open mind and love in your heart. Try to have compassion when when you encounter uh, an Indigenous person who isn't doing very well, who's homeless, on, houseless on the streets. Some other people would suggest um, that uh, that allies, non-Indigenous people, should do a lot of the legwork before asking too many things of Indigenous people. Um, and that's interesting. Um, so like, for example, uh, I've heard in some university spaces um, that um, uh, uh, we shouldn't get we shouldn't be uh, approaching elders so much or we shouldn't be approaching and asking indigenous people to educate us 
uh, non-Indigenous people. That non-Indigenous people, that's the labor of non-Indigenous people to do. We shouldn't be putting that labor on Indigenous people. That That's what I hear. And a part of me agrees with them, but a part of me, I guess it's because I'm a mixed race person. I'm a Métis person. I, I walk down the street and people don't see an Indigenous person. Um, and I have the word peacemaker on my resume. I believe it is my purpose in life to build bridges. Um, and believe me, my boss and I, we have not stopped running since the beginning of this year. Uh, our, we are very busy in our space. We're developing programs and people are coming to us. And so, so a part of me agrees, yes, non-Indigenous people need to take do more of the labor. And yet, on the other hand, um, you know, if we ask people to do the labor without asking questions and then they make a mistake, well, we need to be patient and teach them. You know, there's we got to have patience on both sides. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, those are some great suggestions, Naomi. And and please, before we go, remind us those four words that the old lady spoke about in the film. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you the joke. I don't know if I said it when you were there, but you know, in in English, if you say "old lady" and the the lady has a cane, you better move fast. But in Indigenous culture, in Cree, it's actually old lady, old man. It's a term of endearment. And because I, I reached the big age of 6-0 on March 2nd this year, I give you permission to call me old lady. But the old lady in the film, she teaches us four words. She teaches us, which means kinship, that we're in kinship with each other and all things in creation. The second word she teaches us is nanaskumawin, which means to have gratitude. The third thing that she teaches us is maskuwatsawin, which is to have strength and to be stronger together. And the last word she teaches us is sakihitawin, sakihitawin, which means love. It's interesting. She taught us four words, and four is a spiritual number for Indigenous peoples. Kinship, gratitude, strength, and love. Yeah. Naomi, Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Kinanasko mitinawa, Mr. Hekakio. Thank you all to all your list, listeners. Uh, but to you, uh, Brian, kinanasko mitin. Thank you very much. It's been an honor talking to you. That's our show for today, everybody. Maybe on this holiday, take a couple minutes and think about uh, about this situation, about residential schools, about uh, murdered and missing uh, women, good and girls, about our indigenous heritage. You know, Lincoln, President Lincoln at one uh, time said that uh, slavery was the original sin of the United States. I wonder whether the way we've treated our indigenous brethren is the original sin of Canada. I think it just might be. And uh, we should do something about that. Anyway, thanks very much. Have a great holiday, everybody. And think. Good night.